Good. Well, thank you for having me this evening. It's been a, a pleasure preparing for this, and I'm looking forward to our discussion tonight. I do hope it is a discussion. Uh, as Jamie mentioned, this is a weight in, so it's a high level overview of project management. And uh, if you read the description for tonight, this is not your typical project management discussion. And that's on purpose, it's because I like to think of myself as not a typical project manager. Uh, we're going to cover a few items tonight that will be important to keep in mind that are project related, but we're going to spend a fair amount of time up front on three key aspects. When I met with Jamie, before I asked him what are some of the things you'd like to see covered and he likes to see three items, three or four items that are key takeaways. So here are your three or four items to write down if you're a note taker. To be an effective project manager and really to be effective in, in any of the spaces you're involved in, there are three items, communication, organization, and focus. If you have those three, not only can you be an effective project manager, but you can probably be effective in just about every industry and every line of work you're in. Now, those aren't the only three. There are plenty of others out there, but those are the three we're going to focus on tonight, and then we'll dive into a little bit about uh, project management and how they correlate. First, a little bit about me and why I'm here this evening and why uh, I'm speaking to you about project management. I've been at Mail Clinic for almost 12 years, where I've spent most of that time in the field of project management as a senior PM. Now, many of you, let's see, how many do we have male employees in the room? One, two, three, and I know we have others that have probably worked or worked with Mail. So you, you probably know a little bit about Mail's culture and what it's like to work there. It's a great organization to work for, uh, but it is a fairly um, uh, siloed organization in terms of project management. There's a lot of ways to practice project management and yet in mail, even in mail there are a number of ways to do it, but it's still selected. Uh, outside of mail it's a much wider uh, group and so I have took upon myself to try and research, practice, and also educate in the field of project management outside of mail clinic. I've done so in a variety of ways. Uh, Hyperloop transportation, transportation Technologies is one group I spent three or four years with consulting on the side uh, along with Mayo. Uh, another group called Earthrise Space Foundation. Uh, they are a, or were a uh, uh, small group uh, con uh, contestant for Google Lunar X Prize. And uh, various startups, a couple other universities that I've worked with in the field of project management. That, I did that on purpose in order to help diversify my role as a project manager and my expertise. That information that I gained could go towards mail, and the information I gained at mail was used in those organizations. So how many of you have heard about any of those groups? Hyperloop, have you heard about them? Yes, Jamie, anybody else? A few others? So for those that haven't, Hyperloop uh, is a, uh, well, I'll back up a little bit. Elon Musk, I think in 2014, wrote a white paper about high-speed transit in a tube. So think about uh, when you go to the tellers at the bank, those big tubes that have the, the, you run your check back and forth in. Think about that only people inside of it and much bigger and more complicated. Uh, that's what they're trying to accomplish for high-speed transit. And of course, that's a complicated environment uh, in terms of building a new transit system, uh, new regulations, uh, the, uh, the changes in how transportation is designed and run, uh, the impact to communities. So they need a lot of contributors, and all those contributors need somebody to help manage the projects. I was brought in to help manage a few of those projects, along with do training for project management, particularly in the agile space. And we'll talk about agile and waterfall a little bit later. The other group was, was a Earthrise uh, Space Foundation, and they are, again, a, a very agile-focused group, but they were new to agile, and they needed some training, so I provided that training there. So that is, in a nutshell, the work that I've done outside of mail, along with some teaching and classroom exercises and giving lectures. Uh, and I could stand up here all night with a PowerPoint presentation and give a lecture and probably have all of you to sleep in about 10 minutes because let's make an agreement right now if it's all right. I promise to make this as interesting as possible if you promise to make this a discussion. You see, it's a give and take. I, I can only make it interesting if I know what each of you are doing and what interests you, and it will only be interesting to you if I can change the conversation to focus on each of you. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. All right. So quick round before we get uh, into things here. Can you give me a name and a brief uh, background of your role or what you're doing right now? Start with you. Start with me. Okay. My name is Mary Hartman. Um, I started in, <laughs> I call it my accidental company. Two and a half years ago to fill a niche that was available in the equine or the 
horse industry. Huh. Um, yeah, and it's um, I'm I'm just at the point now where I'm working with a branding company, um, and the Agricultural Utilization Research Institute in Minnesota, to try to um, rebrand and take my product from scale it up basically to really scale it up. Right. Um, so it will be not just national but international. So yeah, and since it was a uh, an accident. Uh, and trying to gain knowledge while I'm managing my business, which is really exciting and interesting for me. It is. Wonderful. Yeah. Great. Thank you for sharing. Mm -hmm. Hi, my name is Nidhi Saprikar. I am a PhD research fellow at Mayo Clinic, so academics. So as far as project management, there is no official project management, mm -hmm. but you know we do manage projects, our scientific projects on daily basis, like experiments and from concept to doing it to publishing it. So, uh, so I'm here to just learn about more about project management. So if I can take the skill to an industry level, if I decide to go tomorrow to an industry, so. I uh, teach at UC Berkeley online, and some of my students right now are researchers. So uh, you're right, that field needs a lot more project management. Yes. Yes. Uh, my name is Tracy Yaff. Um, I've been with Mayo the past 10 years, uh, basically working on non-invasive cancer detection test development uh, as a project manager and also as a helping science field. Um, but recently, um, I left the group and then now I'm joining another company that will be collaborating with Mayo. So I will be starting a new job in a couple of weeks. Exciting. Um, but in terms of my interest, I always really like uh, project management because that's what I've been doing. And I um, also, uh, in terms of my previous mentor, uh, because we develop so many technology, uh, we are having some spin-off to develop a new company startup. So I would like to learn more about like uh, business development site uh, and you know in project management and I have MBA in entrepreneurship and project management experience so this is like perfect combination that I want to hear more about. Sure. So. Excellent. Thank you. That's wonderful. I work at Mayo for three years in the Department of Neurosurgery on brain cancer models wow. and now I am working for a startup in Rochester focused on high like high performance computing reassembling like whole genome sequencing with novel um, algorithms. And it's a split company where part of the company's in California and part of the company's in Rochester. And I find myself doing a lot of coordinating and a lot of like, your, you need to have complementary file structures so we can both understand what's going on and we need, and uh, the, like these three points are dead on the the desperate need for effective communication, mm -hmm. desperate need for effective organization and focus. So that's why I'm here is such that I can embody the project management roles that I've been flirting with. That's great. It's wonderful. So, Thank you. Should I sure. go for it? Yeah, might as well. I, I feel, I'm a student. I'm definitely yeah. a student with this as well. Uh, I'm Julie Keeney. I work at Winona State University, and my role is business outreach. I work to help coordinate professional development, so continuing education, workshops like this, um, and I find partners in all of the communities to deliver and put together workshop series, and then customized training where we develop a program for a specific business and bring an expert on site to the business. So that's what I do. I'm also a student in a master's program, organizational leadership, and right now I'm in a class um, that is lean management, education lean, and I'm going through that process. And next semester I have project management. So that's exciting. You know, I, I've been working projects for the last 20 plus years, but now it's putting more of a framework around that for me. So wonderful. Yeah. Uh, my name is Carla. I currently do uh, research in the Department of Neuro Neurological Surgery, the same thing, modeling, but I'm actually modeling stimulation for deep brain stimulation for Parkinson's patients. Mm -hmm. But I also have a business idea to develop a marketplace where people can go and basically find help for developing different various medical uh, devices. 
and uh, just trying to get a good feel for what it would take to manage projects, especially since the people who are going to be using the, pro the marketplace are going to be needing project managers or will be doing it themselves in order to save themselves that. Also, I'm going to be listening twice as intently. Um, someone that couldn't be here today is really interested in hearing a project manager so in industry, so it would be really interesting to hear and kind of convey. Sure. Good, good. Excellent. That's very helpful for me. Uh, tell me, did you see a theme across here at all? Did anything pop out as you heard what each other was working on, why you're here? The theme I found was diversity. Project management is found just about everywhere. In fact, I have not found a, a group or organization that doesn't benefit from it. So it's a skill set that can be applied anywhere. And each one of you, whether you know it or not, or have been or not, are project managers. I mean, you've gone on vacation, that was a project. You've probably gone and done some remodeling or had remodeling done in your house, that was a project. Uh, car repair or uh, uh, any sort of start and end with scope is a project. We have a start date, we have an end date, hopefully, and uh, some scope work needs to be done. That's, that's a project. So you're all project managers. The other thing uh, that I want to call out is the three items I mentioned, the communication, organization, and focus. You didn't hear anything about work breakdown structure, project plan, risk register, issues register, all these typical project management terms. Any idea why? All of those are tools, and if you don't have the foundation, the tools won't help you. So if you don't have those three items set first, and a good understanding, strong understanding of how to accomplish those three, the tools aren't going to fix it. And that's one thing you'll hear hopefully throughout tonight's conversation is that tools are there as a aid, but not to take the place of the human factor. We need to have the brain up here working properly in order to use the tools. So let's start with communication. Who here thinks they're a great communicator? Or, or knows of somebody who's a great communicator? <laughs> yeah. 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 Do you know one? Do you know a great communicator? I think we had one yesterday, it was uh, Jocelyn, I think was like a really good communicator. Um, yep. Really a, a tent and more of a listener, so she really gets her point across to everyone. You hit the key part that most people skip, and that is the listening. In order to be a great communicator, you have to be an effective listener. That's excellent that you, you found that right away, because it's, it's funny how often that gets left aside. It's so intuitive for us to be... Uh, if we think communication, we think talking, we think writing an email or sending a text message or being on the phone. It's something to do with verbal communication or written communication. But listening oftentimes gets left aside, unfortunately. So how do we solve that problem? How do we listen more effectively? Anyone got a clue or seen somebody in action that uh, you want to share what they did? I have a couple. Mm -hmm. Throughout the night, I'll, I'll, I'll give you a few hints or some, some practice points to use. My, my, my stretch goal for each of you is to find some time in the next 24 to 48 hours to use them. Not for the whole day, mm -hmm. not even for an hour, just a little bit here and there. Try them out and see how they work. If they work for you, do more and more and more. It's kind of like exercise. Uh, you know, if you haven't been running, you probably don't want to go out and start a 5K <laughs> right off the bat, right? You, you want to work up to it. Otherwise, it's just going to fail right off the bat. So, so try looking for, in the next uh, 24 to 48 hours, try looking for a way to use this next uh, skill. Active listening involves concentration when you're uh, with an individual or group. So. Let's say we're having a conversation about a problem on a project. And I ask, I'm asking, uh, what is the major problem you have with your project right now? Your response is, well, I'm having trouble with this one stakeholder. He or she isn't committing to the project like it should be. About that point in time, I'm thinking about my response. Hmm. Halfway through, the answer. Now, what's the problem with that? This is, this is what generally what people do. What's the problem with thinking about your answer halfway through the response? You're not hearing mm -hmm. the, the entire sentence. You need to right. wait and then respond afterwards. That's right. You could be missing key information. Mm -hmm. Right. What else? Anything? I'm kind of guilty of this. I autocomplete people's sentences. So sure. I tend to interrupt them before they finish speaking. And I definitely realize it's not a very good communicator skill. That can happen, yeah. Yeah, that's another piece. 
I, I may stop uh. listening and I may autocomplete and actually autocomplete the wrong thing. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And for some reason, yeah. there's that disconnect where I don't actually hear what they're saying and I'm just making it this, I don't know, it's weird. It, it, you start to mm-hmm. warp the world around you mm-hmm. in a way. And you're in a little bit of a haze, uh-huh. you're not quite sure where yeah. things are going in the conversation. Yeah. So, so we just had this, my husband and I are fortunate to get to travel. And when we go through customs, I always say to him, I'll handle it. Because the customs person inevitably says, how long are you going to be here and where are you mm-hmm. staying? Have you done this or that? Then I cannot tell you the number of times he has said something that has absolutely nothing to do with the question that he's been <laughs> asked, which has resulted going into Canada and having our car searched mm. and other things. And I've said to him, when they, when they ask a question, you answer the question, but he is already so far ahead mm-hmm. of what it is that he thinks they're going to say. Right. Yeah, that's that, the mm, question that wasn't asked. Yeah. Right. Yep. Not even on the right topic sometimes. No. Just off yeah. left field, digressing. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Do you have something? Yes, I was thinking too about assumptions, how mm-hmm. I tend to then, based upon my experience in maybe similar situations, I start to fill in the blank. And, mm-hmm. and you know, that's kind of what we were saying before too, but assuming that we have a grasp on the whole picture when really we don't. Right. Yeah. Right. Absolutely, and, and it doesn't take very long for the other person to recognize this is happening too. It, it, that, that shows, and it, you know, if you're in a startup organization, um, or even just trying to move to that position in your own career, you need to be able to look for every advantage you can to set yourself apart from your competition, and effective listening is one way to do that. So what they recommend is, if you're in that conversation, you're talking about the stakeholders not working well, first of all, when you come to that conversation, make sure you don't have distractions like uh, a phone out on the table and it's getting text messages and calls or your laptop. I mean, we all do this to some extent. I'm guilty too, but really try uh, to use this more often. So no distractions. Uh, don't think about your answer. And that's going to take some, some forceful changes, a, a real change in habit. But don't think about anything other than listening to each word they're saying. And then to prove that you've been listening, do a verification step. Ask, okay, this is what I heard. Let me know if I've got it right. Mm-hmm. Before you give your answer, just give the verification stuff. The next important piece is pause. And this is really awkward <laughs> because we're so used to instant uh, communication, instant gratification, instant meals uh, through drive throughs and microwave dinners and, and text messages and all that, that we pause has become very awkward, especially in a, in a conversation. But they're very important because that is the point in time when you should be thinking about what your response is. You received the verification that you heard uh, the response correctly, and now you're going to take a moment and you can tell them, okay, just give me one moment to, to pause about this a second to think about this, and then provide your answer. A couple things happen. You may think that this will drag the conversation out, and you're going to have you're going to be there forever. Actually, what happens is you end up spending less time because now you're focused, you have a much better understanding of what is going on, you're not miscommunicating, and ultimately you have a much richer conversation than you would otherwise. And that comes through when you're talking to whoever it is you're, you're communicating with, a, a fellow team member on a project, or an individual that you're uh, a client or an individual you're working with. So it's important to have these key conversations and make sure that you're attentive, li- attentively listening during the conversation. Any questions on that? How else can we effectively communicate? Any ideas? We do it vocally, that's one. Eye contact. Eye contact is another, because that shows that I'm talking to you right now. Mm-hmm. Body language. Body, language. Body position, facing the individual. Yeah. Posture. Yeah. yeah, making sure you don't have any blocking you, you know, right. barriers, put those down as mm-hmm. much as possible. Well, the reason for the laptop is it's yeah. an automatic barrier, right? Yep. I mean, you and whoever right. you're trying to communicate, it's got right. a wall. Right. You, iPads don't, but you know, it's still... Yes. <laughs> um, what about where you sit in the room? So let's say this is a boardroom right now, okay? And uh, <laughs> you were talking about that. <laughs> yeah, really. <laughs> it's a hot topic. I want that Nobody seat. Likes I don't to know. Sit in the <laughs> well, there is the front row thing, you know, the old church and all that. But you know, yeah. 
aside from that, let's say this is a boardroom where we're here to talk about a, a project that's maybe in red status, it'll be a, a troubled project. And uh, we know that one member of the board is, has been uh, a distractor, been somebody that really has been against the project all along. This is going to be a great opportunity for them to try to just derail the whole thing. Where might you position normally, would you position yourself to that individual? Next to them. That's where you want to be. Mm -hmm. But oftentimes we pick across. Mm -hmm. We don't want to sit next to the person we've been having arguments with, usually. We mm -hmm. tend to pick right away. So what's the problem? If, I, if, if the person I'm arguing with is sitting right there, and I'm sitting right here, and we've got the table between us, what's the problem with that? There's a boundary. There's a boundary? Yeah. 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 It appears more confrontational. Confrontational. Mm -hmm. It's a me and them mm -hmm. scenario, or me and mm -hmm. her or him. Mm -hmm. Whereas if I'm sitting next to them, it's very difficult to argue with somebody you are sitting right next to. It can happen, yes, but it's mm -hmm. much more difficult than if you're across the table. It's almost natural to argue with people across the table. But when you're sitting next to them, side by side, it is very difficult to argue. So try to look for those opportunities if you're in a meeting or an area where you need to uh, get somebody to, to hopefully see your point of view easier. That's one way to accomplish that. Again, it's another communication technique. So why do you think I'm hitting communication so hard? It's the basis for everything. Right, so Project Management Institute, uh, PMI, they're the predominant uh, project management organization in Northern America, you could argue the world, uh, but certainly a, a leader. They have what's called a Project Management uh, Body of Knowledge book. I saw something over here that triggered my, it's kind of like this. <laughs> it's really dry, has a lot of pages, maybe not quite that thick. Uh, if you want really good reading material to put you to sleep, that is the <laughs> one to go to. Mm -hmm. um, it's it's awesome for that. It's, and if you ever choose to study for their certification, which project managers usually do, it's called the PMP, Project Management mm -hmm. Professional. Mm -hmm. You need to pretty much memorize that book. So it's it's a challenge. In there, they say, at least the last time I read it, they said that it was about 90% of what a project manager does is communication. So, and I would argue really 100%, because ev everything we do in some form or another comes back to communication. Our staff reports, our uh, team engagements, uh, even when we discuss issues and risks, it's all some form of communication. So that's why I'm, I'm pushing that pretty hard. I know we're probably running a long time, so I will move to the next one. So uh, we've covered communication, the next is organization. Now you might be thinking organization is a project plan. And while, yes, that is a tool that can be helped to be organized, I'm actually referring to more of what you might actually consider to be organization, just being an organized individual. Uh, let's let's think about what a desk looks like. What does your desk look like? Describe your desk for us. Or do you have one? Oh, it's pretty. It's pretty like yep. void. I keep things like put Part away. Three, yep. Yeah, and then I use them as I need them, and then I put them back. Okay. So there's like not much. Have any of you worked with somebody that had you know, like stacks of papers up to here? <laughs> <laughs> so. <laughs> <laughs> Not me. No. <laughs> <laughs> but she knows. I don't the want to person. put anybody in the video. <laughs> she knows the But I do. I do. I'm more of a uh, positional person. Yes. So uh -huh. I do pile stuff, but in a way that I would know what pile is what to to go through. I'm yes. so glad you said that. My my wife and I are are almost exactly like in many ways. One way we're not is organization. So she is pretty much like she has stacks, but she, I mean, you ask her for something, she will go and pull it out of one stack in there in, in, in an instant, I mean, quickly. I'm very much like you, minimalist, got to be organized. I'm not saying there's one way that it's wrong or right. What I am saying is universally, how easy is it for somebody to go to an organized file system that's alphabetical versus one that's a stack of papers? Can most people walk up to a desk with a stack of random papers and pick out what they need to find quickly? Or can they go to a filing? Well, we don't use filing cabinets much anymore, but you get what I mean. Can, can they go to a filing cabinet and find what they need because it's alphabetical? Alphabetical is fairly universal, right? Mm -hmm. The stack of papers, not so much. One person can find this. Mm -hmm. Numerous people can find the one over here. And in project management, that's really important because you may or may not always be on that project. You could win the lottery, some people say. It. You have my boss, that's too morbid. But you can win the law, <laughs> quit the project, or you can get moved to a different project. It happens all the time. Mm -hmm. And then what you've left is uh, an unorganized project that somebody has to try to figure out where things are at. 
Whereas if it was organized in a universal manner, alphabetical, or if you have, uh, if your company uses a special uh, uh, database and it's all kept electronically, whatever works for the larger sum is what you want to try to accomplish. Mm -hmm. And that's what I'm trying to get when I mean organization. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So the, the other key with organization is trying to figure out how to apply this to project management specifically. If we're organized in our lives, that's great. If we're not, as long as it doesn't impact the project, it's not the end of the world, right? So how do we do it in a project? How do we be specifically organized in a project setting? Anybody want to take us? Or have you seen other good project managers? How, how have they been organized? I like Gantt charts. Gantt charts? I like to know like, what is waiting on what and have people understand like what they do in terms of other people's work. Sure. How they impact the whole movement. Okay, so a visual presentation. Yeah. Okay, very good. Others? I, I built my own access database because I managed like 20 different projects yeah. at the same time. Right. Yeah, so, right. you know, put them in programs, projects, and tasks and resources. Yep, yep. Mm -hmm. Okay. So visual, more of a, a list type approach. Mm -hmm. like tables. Like tables. Like, yeah, mm -hmm. like list maybe, like, right. like that. Right. And so a lot of tools, mm -hmm. a, a lot of uh, methods. What do we use for... Uh, or you said you said Excel was it or access? access. You said access. Yeah. Microsoft access. Microsoft yeah. access. And so <clears throat> there are tons of tools out there to use. Uh, you know, from project plan standpoint, Microsoft Project. Uh, there's the uh, Smartsheets, Trello. I mean, the list: Jira, Trello. TFS, Team Foundation mm -hmm. Server. Yeah. Jamie introduced me to Trello, and now our full department is on Trello. Wow, I should get a kickback. You should. <laughs> we integrated that into Teams. So we use Microsoft Teams and then we have Trello boards. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, so there's lots of tools out there to pick to stay organized. But just like the scenario I mentioned earlier between the organized desk and the not organized desk or the filing cabinet and the stack of papers, we need to pick something that's universal, that works across our team. Because if we don't, it's only helping one person. And I've seen that happen over and over again. A project manager has been on a project, so managing projects for years and years and years. They're so used to, let's say, a Microsoft project. I'm not picking on that one, but just, you know, just use it as an example. And they, they want to keep using it for every project they're working on. Well, what if they go on a team that's never used MS Project before? They've used Smartsheets or Trello or something else. How effective is that going to be? Now, some of the team might say, well, I don't do any project plan. I don't have to worry about it. That's the PM. They can worry about that. But if, a, if you're a really good project manager, you're going to incorporate your team in building that plan. And you're going to incorporate the plan to be available for the team. So they can see it, they can view it, maybe, maybe not edit it, depending upon you know, how, how you work as a team, uh, but certainly have the input to edit it. So you want something that's available across the team, not just for the project manager. Mm -hmm. And that's where it comes to being organized in a way that impacts the team as a whole versus just the project manager. And this, it goes beyond the, the project plan, you know, uh, the issues register as well, risk register where you document specific risk to the project and specific issues that are occurring in the project. You want a way that works across your team, maybe even across the organization that's large enough. Any questions about that? Organization is pretty key. It's kind of hard to do though, like Mayo is trying to implement this clarity mm -hmm. yes, they for are. the high level project management. Right. But is really costly, and a lot of the you know research labs are small. Mm -hmm. They do have a lot of projects, but they can't afford to get licensing of five hundred dollar per headcount. Right. And you cannot have all everyone have access and change the uh, the in clarity either. So it's a balance of. It is a balance. Yes. The um, <coughs> you know, and a male is a little bit different because of the way. They, each department runs and they're budgeting. So you have to bear that in mind, that is very true. If you've had the opportunity uh, <coughs> in your department or certainly outside of the to look at other options, let's say a, a licensed product is too expensive, uh, then some of the free where it would be a better route might be considered. Now you have to be careful, again, at Mayo because of the whole uh, data protection mm -hmm. and you know, what, what can we actually license and not license. Uh, but you can use, as far as I'm last checked, Excel, which is open to pretty much everyone. Now, it's not a project management tool. I, I, it's, a, you know, it's used for a lot of things. It was originally a budget tool, if I remember right. But, so, uh, but it, there were ways to configure it. And, and if you're running a, a relatively 
small or medium sized project, Excel can work just fine with you know, some, some messing around with it. Uh, the key part is, again, you're finding something that works for your team as a whole. I also think this is a side note, I think from the Mayo doc you can get Microsoft Project 2007 and that's mm -hmm. free for the organization, I believe. Yeah. It's also a little troublesome to use, so <laughs> be careful that one. Um, so the key point is, is looking for something that works for your team and, and it keeps you organized and your team can buy into. Uh, I've seen a number of, uh, of areas of risk with projects where maybe half the team is supportive of the tool and the other half isn't. And you want to get on the same page at the beginning of the project because that will that will turn into be a, a real issue later on. Uh, every single thing that goes wrong with the project will somehow be tied back to that. They'll say, oh, it's because we chose that tool and we'll just latch onto that. So, so really try to solve the issue at the beginning. Do you give access to everyone in the team or do you selectively whoever has the, like how do you decide? Um, I do. Yeah, because of one specific reason. I believe that trust is a key factor in every successful team. I have yet to see a team or a project succeed where trust wasn't used, where they didn't have trust. If it failed, you can almost always find where they didn't have trust. What I mean by that is I want to be able to trust my team to open up the tool and use it, maybe even edit it as long as they're discussing it so we all know what's being changed. Uh, and certainly provide feedback on what things should change because ultimately what's in that tool it's the work they're doing right so if anybody should have a say into that it's them it's the one doing the work you know let's say it's an IT project your developers they're the one that are, are, are building the project we're as a PM we're just there facilitating and helping coordinate and, and manage but they're building it so they're the ones you want to have uh, uh, giving the information, how long is it going to take, what are the dependencies. Uh, so that's, that's critical. So trust is a very key part. Same, same thing if you're building a bridge or a house, uh, you need to trust your team. Does that answer your question? I don't know. I, at least in my experience, like, um, like the PIs, right. they really don't want to touch anything. They just want to discuss and you know, leave. So yeah. um, depending well, on my audience, I would do a presentation and then I will update them myself. <laughs> yes. Rather than having somebody, I guess, giving access to everyone, mm -hmm. right. and then they don't really care to update them. So to be, to be, uh, thank you for that. To be clear, when I say access, because you're right, developers are, are similar. They, they don't necessarily want to jump into a project management tool and start putting in dates mm -hmm. and all that. They want the PM to do that. I just want them to have access to do it. I want them to feel like they could if they wanted to. I still need to be responsible to make sure that the plan is updated and current and correct. And that means having those conversations and working with individual team members. But I want them to know that I'm not somehow blocking that from them because that creates an environment where they think I'm communicating differently to leadership and not communicating what they've told me will take for each task. You know, in other words, I'm telling leadership our project's taking a year, they're telling me it's gonna take two. And I'm somehow supposed to make that work or the other way around. Does that make sense? So you're not expecting them to do it, but at the same time, just a share, just a share, transparency. Mm -hmm. yeah. Other questions? Okay, perfect. Let's move on to the next one. Focus. Who has trouble focusing these days? Mm -hmm. Anyone? I do. Oh yeah. Yeah, I'm all the time. Thinking on something else. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yep. Your mind wanders. Mm -hmm. You get distracted. So you're sitting at your desk. Mm -hmm. At least I am, and I see others doing this, and. You got your monitor up there. You got uh, your phone over here. It's sending text messages to you. You got Skype coming up here. Somebody's skyping you. Got an email coming in. Somebody's walking around the corner and wants to answer a question. Trump's latest tweet comes up. You know, you get <laughs> getting all this bombarded with uh, information oh, and overload. Yeah. And <laughs> all you can do is, is just you know scream some days because all this stuff is coming at you. So how do you stay focused in that kind of environment? What do you do? What, what's what if it's found anything that works? Uh, I remove like all social media from my phone, <laughs> um, yeah. mm. and you know, have sprints where I will set a timer and go, mm. I will focus on this for this amount of time, and then if something randomly pops into my head, I have a notepad where I just jot, 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 mm. and then that's for later. Um, it doesn't always work. 
but at least mm -hmm. it's something. It's something. Right. That's mm -hmm. what I'm trying to do. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You can't control when your like mind actually can't. So if you have like a migraine or something like that, like you can't mm -hmm. control focus. Or you got three hours of sleep. So yeah, yeah. So yeah, that that for me is like that wall that you always yeah. think of. Like I, I pushed it as far as I could go. But I don't know. I have a calendar of the week, and then I mm -hmm. fill in an hourly a day. And that kind of, it's just not like uh, like what Carla should be doing, but it's like if I want to get it done, this is approximately <coughs> what I should be doing. Right. And right. that way I don't have to think about it like when I start my day, I don't have to go, oh, what am I going to do now? Oh, but this is this other thing. And let me just juggle three things at once. It's like, no, this does this for two hours, and then you can yeah. think about yeah. this for three hours. Yeah. Yeah. Those are some key points, absolutely. So let's let's talk about those a little bit. The, the bombardment of information is, is wearing on us in a number of ways. I mean, sensory overload, uh, I spent, I did this a few times, I spent the whole day just trying to respond to the messages coming in, right? I just to see how much I could get done. Emails or Skype messages or conversations and meetings. I also had a bucket of things that I wanted to get done that day. Do you think I got to the bucket at all? No. no. Oh. And over and over again, I keep thinking, I'll get to that bucket, I'll get to that bucket. Mm -hmm. It never it seems to happen, it never happens. So, what can we do to get to that bucket? How, who here has heard of time boxing? I think it was alluded to, I think you alluded to it a little bit in, in your conversation there. Um, time, to create a bucket of time for a specific task. And I like to do it on my calendar. I like to actually yeah. put the task mm -hmm. on my calendar. I do it the night before. Night before, mm -hmm. yep, mm -hmm. that works too. Mm -hmm. Now, I do it in a way that uh, I can move it around. You can also do it as a fixed point in time. Let's say you have a report you have to create every week. So the report typically takes you an hour. You put a little blocker on your calendar saying this mm -hmm. hour of each week I'm going to write this report. Mm -hmm. And you could always move that block as long as you don't take it off the week, right? You just got to leave one out. Mm -hmm. And then during that hour, you focus. Now focus to me means no other notifications. You can shut notifications off, you can turn your phone off, you can tell people not to bother you for that hour, uh, especially if it's blocked on the calendar, that helps if people are using calendars. Uh, and what I found when I first started doing this is that the task that typically took me an hour, I was able to get done in about 40 minutes, somewhere in that range. Mm -hmm. you know, I saved about 20 minutes simply by focusing. The other thing I found is that if that adds up, if I start doing that for more of my bucket work, then I could save multiple hours a week pretty quickly. Mm -hmm. Now focus is tough. Uh, we're, again, we're in an environment where everybody wants our attention, especially as project managers. I mean, we have our team coming to us, we have leadership coming to us from both ends. Mm -hmm. So focus can be very difficult. I'm not advocating to turn off your notifications and not receive emails all day long. What I'm, what I'm saying is pick a good chunk of time each day to do that and then open up and, and receive the emails and notifications during another chunk of time. Uh, I, I like the practice of checking email twice a day. Some people say three, some people say one. I kind of lean towards the twice a day. Maybe once in the mid-morning, once in the mid-afternoon, and then that's it and then the next day. What that does is creates two things. One, it starts to remove the amount of focus you spend on email versus the work that's supposed to get done. Mm -hmm. Now it's true, some of the work comes through via email mm -hmm. and we have to get that done too. That's why mm -hmm. we check twice a day. Yeah. And, and that doesn't mean that we're simply only working on that task during email time. We could block that off in the calendar. If we get a request through email, we know we have to accomplish it. It's coming from our boss. Uh, then we can make some time, I'll do that this afternoon for an hour, tomorrow for two hours. Uh, but what it also does for us, we, if we respond instantly, this comes back to the communications side, if we respond instantly to our messages, text, email, otherwise, what does that set up? Expectations. Expectations. Uh, yeah. People say they're right on it constantly. Yes. Yeah. Yes. So yeah. that may sound good. Mm -hmm. It may sound good that, okay, well, they respond very fast, that's great. Mm -hmm. It could mean, it could send another message that maybe you don't have enough to do yeah. if you respond right away. Mm -hmm. And two, what happens if you get that message at 8 at night or mm -hmm. 7 on Saturday? Or, I mean, yeah. It's the same expect expectation of flying. Sometimes it kind of does. Mm -hmm. You kind of build that yeah. habit. Yeah. Whereas if you do it twice a day, uh, mm -hmm. you, you, you're still responsive. It's mm -hmm. still, I mean, you, you have the chance twice a day to, to catch that email. And yet it's not so responsive. You're giving this impression that you have all this free time. You can just you can jump right in. It'll also help you, again, focus, which is the, the key with this a part. A question about yeah. that. Yeah. Our work um, institutes like a, a Slack messenger. Sure. Yep. And it's, I, I check my work email maybe once a day, if sure. that. Yeah. Um, 
but that Slack notification is like, oh, there's this project going, bing, 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 multiple times throughout the day. Would you, and it's it's almost the expectation that everybody's watching it. Mm. Yeah, and, and that's uh, so. A number of organizations we use something like that or, or Skype and, and uh, some form of instant messaging. I treat it just like email, and you can actually okay. set some of them up to send you emails uh, versus yeah. the actual text. Uh, that may or may not be appropriate or need uh, need to do that, but I treat it just like the email side. Now I might create a window mm -hmm. where I'll check it for a little bit longer, maybe uh, half an hour or an hour each day. I'll just leave it open and let it come in and respond. But the point is, if you just leave that open all day long and you try to get other work done, you're not going to be nearly as productive. Mm -hmm. It just won't happen. Now, yeah. maybe that's the scenario you're in and, and that's appropriate. Uh, it's kind of like if you're an on-call doc. I'm not saying don't use your pager. I mean, you've got to mm -hmm. be able to, patient safety comes first and all that, yeah, emergency, absolutely. Uh, mm -hmm. But if you're in a, a scenario where that isn't the case and it's okay for you to go mm -hmm. several hours without responding to a, a text, an email, uh, instant message, then I think you'll find yourself more productive. The other thing I found is that um, the way I work, anything that is uh, more difficult in nature or technical uh, that really just you know deserves more focus, I do in the morning. Yes. <coughs> For me, because I hit by like one to three o'clock. I just hit. I call it the trough. Yep. I just should be like taking a siesta and, and living Ooh, in Mexico or something. Yeah. Because then after three, I pick up again. Sure. The three to six, but I have this like whatever trough and so if I leave the report that's really important and you know or such to the afternoon oh man it just takes me twice as long and mm -hmm. yeah so I've kind of learned some ways to work and block time that way that's excellent a lot of the uh, productivity gurus if you will talk about that as uh, uh, eating the frog so they say do the thing that you most Dislike, dislike yeah. <laughs> in the yeah. morning. Yeah. Get it out of the way. Because yeah. otherwise you're just dreading it all day long, which brings down your whole day. Yeah. Whereas if you just get it done right away, it's kind of like exercise. That's, what it, that's one of the reasons they say exercise in the morning because you know, get it out of the way. Mm -hmm. um, uh, or have your meeting with your boss in the morning, get out of the way. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, yes, that's an excellent mm -hmm. point. And it really helps make not only make you more productive, because that is the point in time when after you get caffeine, after mm -hmm. your brain is really functioning at, at its peak. Throughout the day, you get a little worn down, and, and sometimes you get that second win, and you can mm -hmm. accomplish more after three. But excellent point. Yes. Yeah. Other. That's great to have those conversations too here tonight. Are there other uh, key items that you use to be more productive? You want to share? Anything? And shut the door. Shut the door. I yeah. have the dog. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I make priorities. Like I know this is what I have to do today. If I don't do it, yeah, it's the end of the world for my career. Or for the project or something, so right. mm -hmm. it's the priority, this is what I have to do and not to bring personal life so much, but being a mom, I don't know when I get a call from school that you need to go pick your child today, he's sick. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. priorities, this needs to be done, this needs to be done, this needs to be done, these things, I have time to get it done. But like what she said, I make uh, a to-do list mm -hmm. the day before. And then it's like a tick mark, and then it gives me that satisfaction when I cross it. So and there's something to be said about that the crossing off or crumpling up and throwing away the past. It feels yes. so good. It does. Mm -hmm. yeah. It does. Yeah. One of the, I, I work in a pseudo open office, and sometimes I uh, there's conversations that are very distracting. Mm -hmm. I'm like, that's interesting. I need, I wish I could engage, but I can't. So I'll like, white noise. Yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah, we have. Uh, mm -hmm. You talk about earphones or earphones? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Put in, put in earbuds, or earbuds or yeah. something, mm -hmm. or headphones, and yep. white noise or mm -hmm. something. Yep. Music is just too distracting. Right, right. Mm -hmm. Sometimes mm -hmm. it's helpful, sometimes it's not. Yeah, yeah. yeah it depends mm -hmm. on the task. I have that too. There's some tasks if it's really routine, I can listen to music, but it's not. I got to think on it. Okay, go ahead. Mm -hmm. yeah. That's a good one, and I've seen that used in open spaces quite often. Uh, it, you even have electronic, if this was your monitor, they even have a little, little electronic flags now that will stick up here and you can put them on red, green, or yellow, you know, depending mm -hmm. on your status and what you're available if you want to have a conversation. Oh, really? Yeah. Oh. I suspect they could even tie it into like uh, Skype instant messaging where it has, you know, your availability. Yeah. They used to have a little rotating sign on my desk yeah. that says available, not available, <laughs> give me 10 minutes. <laughs> I don't have my caffeine yet. Yeah. <laughs> Something like that, yeah. 
<laughs> my dad, I was at a sign on his door that said, knock before you enter, think before you knock. There you go. That's good. Oh, yeah. I like that. Well, yeah. That's <laughs> <good>. <laughs> if only people would do that. Well, well we did. You only, you only made the mistake once. <laughs> <laughs> There's the Pomodoro timers. So you do 15 uh, minute stretches of work and then you get five minutes break. So if that works, if it's something that you know is going to take hours to do, you can't really focus for hours unless you're on some kind of, you know, yeah. amphetamine. So <laughs> <laughs> you can go and, and kind of break it up for yourself. And then after, I think, an hour, you get a 15 minute break. So you kind of get a little bit longer. That's when you get up and kind of move around or do something yeah. guilt free. Yeah. Does that work? I use it for studying, especially. Because studying is one of those things you do like whole yes. days or whole weekends. Mm -hmm. You can't realistically focus for a whole weekend. That's, so what, that's a great way of hacking mm. your productivity because it wanes and when you take a break and just do something totally different. Yeah, you can do and whatever you want guilt-free. Yeah. Yeah, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah uh, the most productive time of my PhD is when I had a buddy of mine and I do that for two weeks solid. Like every hour we took a walk around a fountain. Yeah, zoom, especially zoom. like moving the body. Yes. Yep. Oh, and, and I think of, my, um, I have the, the standing or sitting desk. Yes. Yep. Yeah. And if I am writing composing content, if I stand, it just comes so much better. Wow. That's really? Cool. For whatever reason, I discovered that. If I'm sitting and I'm, you know, blank slate and start to compose a document, yeah. and stand up, and all of a sudden I'm like, ah, yeah, and then I just get into it. That's, I don't know. Yeah, try that. That's crazy. Good. <laughs> okay, that's awesome. And, and productivity is, is so key across all disciplines, not just project management. Mm -hmm. This is stuff that you can use day in, day out uh, as in, in whatever career you're, you're in. So, communication, organization, and focus. How do we apply those then to project management tools? We knew eventually we talked a little bit about tools and a little bit about real project management. Let's just get into it. Mm -hmm. um, there are two fields of project management primarily. And this isn't a deep dive, this is a high level, so we'll, we'll stay mm -hmm. high. Waterfall and Agile. So who's heard, who here has heard of Waterfall? Is everyone pretty much? Okay, so real quickly, Waterfall is a plan up front. We are going to uh, review the requirements for the project, understand what needs to be done, who needs to do it, when, where, how long will it take them. We're going to put that all in a project plan, get it all set, and then we are going to execute that project plan. We're going to go off, you know, check off the list, one, two, three, all the way down. Agile. You all heard about Agile? And my focus is primarily on Scrum-ish. Uh, and uh, that, that framework, that method, is uh, iterative. So we're working with probably fewer known requirements, a little bit less understanding of the work, and uh, maybe even a need to deliver sooner. And we can use Agile to do that because it works in sprints. We mentioned, I think it was in the sprints about something earlier we talked about. Uh, so sprints can be anywhere from one week to four weeks usually, and oftentimes they're two. We will uh, work from what's called a backlog, which is the list of priorities you mentioned earlier. Thanks for bringing that up. A backlog is prioritized by a product owner uh, who will uh, tell us all the items we know that need completed, which one is most important, second, third, and fourth, and that is an extremely difficult job. Most don't do it. They just tell you it's all important and you need to come out. <laughs> but uh, with working with them, you can get to the point where you can prioritize that list, and then you start to put the top priority items into sprint number one, then sprint number two, and three. And after a few sprints, you get what's called a velocity, where you start to know how much you can get accomplished each sprint. And the nice thing about this is it delivers uh, uh, key components of the project earlier. It allows for change and pivots throughout, so that if you get two or three sprints in and you find out this isn't working, that's change and try something different. Uh, it also gives the opportunity to learn early on. And you get to learn, uh, ideally, daily, uh, but at least every sprint where you have a retrospective. Now, there is a number of things that are agile that can be used in Waterfall. And there are actually a few things in Waterfall that can be used in agile. Who wants to guess as to which one is best, Agile or Waterfall? It depends. Mm -hmm. Thank you. You talk to some people and they will adamantly tell you that Waterfall is the best or that Agile is the only way to go. It really does depend. And, and it's your job as a project manager to lead that discussion and help determine for the specific project which one is appropriate. Uh, 
go to your website. Your client doesn't know exactly what they want. They know they want a home page, they want contact, but they don't know how many pictures, they don't know if they want a search function, they don't know if they want it to tie into some database. They might, or maybe next week they change their mind again. Might be an agile project, right? That might be a bridge built it seven times before. You have uh, worked with the same team repeatedly. You know the dynamics. Might be a waterfall project. No pun intended, bridge. <laughs> yeah. um, so, you know, there are cases where you would lean more towards one or the other, but there's still disciplines you can use across the board. So one of the key parts of Agile, one of the pieces I like the most is called, in Scrum, is called a daily Scrum, like a stand-up meeting, where you meet in the morning for 5, 10, not more than 15 minutes, and your team discusses what went on yesterday, what are they doing today, and what are the roadblocks, what's, what's a blocker to them from getting the work done. And you go across the, the room or a virtual call if you, if you need to, and you have that conversation. What's to prevent you from having that same conversation in a waterfall project? Just timing. Yeah. You can talk like that in a waterfall project too. Mm -hmm. In fact, I think you should talk. And construction does that. They have their morning uh, yeah. stand up, you know, they call it different things. But, and, and even in healthcare, physicians uh, will have that rounds and, and, and all those discussions early morning huddles. Uh, like, Wife is a nurse uh, at Mayo, and she has her morning huddle with the other nurses. Uh, this is a good common practice, uh, even in operational world, not just the project management world. Uh, another uh, transition point that can work for both is lessons learned. So traditionally in Waterfall, they, they tell you to do the lessons learned at the end of the project. What's the problem with doing the lessons learned? You don't, I should ask, do you know what a lessons learned is? It wasn't. So it's a, it's a session where you talk about what went well and what didn't, and hopefully learn from that. So what's the problem of waiting until the end of the bridge construction before you do a lesson learning? You can only apply to the next project rather than mm -hmm. improving as you go along? Right, right, exactly. And hopefully it applies to the next project, but it usually gets filed away, <laughs> unfortunately. Um, <clears throat> So yes, we want to do, even in waterfall projects, periodic lessons learned. Uh, some will say monthly, some will say bi-monthly. You really, it's project dependent. It's how long the project is, what you're working on, uh, and uh, but at any rate, use lessons learned throughout like you would in an agile project. The other thing that I think is important is that waterfall gets the reputation of having meetings after meetings after meetings. Agile gets the reputation of being, we're agile, we don't meet, we don't plan, we don't document. Mm -hmm. Not true and not true. <laughs> so yeah, yeah. Agile has plenty of meetings, uh, but they're focused. Again, we mentioned focused mm -hmm. earlier. Uh, they have retrospective, they have less uh, stand-ups, they have the iteration planning, the, uh, backlog refinement. Those are all meetings. Now, they have names for them, and they actually refer to them in Scrum World as uh, uh, what it, ceremonies, uh, events now, I think they change it to events. So, uh, <clears throat> you know, but there's still, it's a fancy name for meeting. You're still meeting. In the project management world, just because, or the waterfall world, it isn't just because it's waterfall that we meet all the time. It, it's, it's still, it can still be a lessons learned. It can still be a refinement of the project plan. Uh, it can still be a, uh, a focus on planning our next few weeks uh, and adjusting the project plan. Because we all know, right, when we finish a project plan, do we ever touch it again? Mm -hmm. I mean, it's perfect. It's done. We never touch it, right? No, of course, we touch it. The first <laughs> death in every war is a plan, right? I mean, so every project, the first death is a plan. Uh, and so we know we're going to change it, and it's going to alter periodically throughout the project. So might as well get used to that and make those alterations uh, as needed. And, and those are part of a meeting or a ceremony or an event. I have a question about that. Yeah. <clears throat> so like with uh, hosting these meetings, there's a uh, accountability for each person that wants to participate in this meeting, right? So what you say, right. but there's some people that uh, prefer like more the anonymous way where you just kind of email some central person and then it becomes a topic of discussion and it's not really tied to a person and then there's like the radical transparency. We're going to rate each other in this meeting real time and like there's two extremes. But like, what do you find is a really good balance between anonymous and extremely transparent? If you're working in the Agile space, they're going to push trust, like we mentioned earlier. And they're going to say, you need to create, if you, if you haven't gotten to the point as a team where you can be, you can trust each of you to bring up anything, any topic, any concern, any risk, then you haven't really gotten to the point of being an effective team. Tuckman's uh, model of uh, forming, storming, norming, and performing. 
And every team has to go through those phases. And so your team probably hasn't gotten to that point if they aren't trusting each other to have those conversations. And that's okay. It takes time to go through that. Managers and leaders like to rush that a little bit, but it's, it's going to take as long as it's going to take. Now, there are still other schools of thought, and they tend to be more, I think, in the waterfall space where you want to leave an opportunity for somebody to give input uh, anonymously. And you can argue back and forth which is best or not. Um, my team recently, or not my specific team, but our group, recently had a conversation about anonymous service and using uh, a tool to help bring in information that might be reluctant to be shared otherwise. Uh, I, I tend to kind of lean towards Agile's thought on this. I like trust, and I'd rather build, I'd rather put my energy towards the trust than trying to get an anonymous survey. But the information is helpful either way. If you can do it through a survey and get the information to help turn the project around, uh, then then do that. Uh, but I, I would rather put the, uh, the effort towards the team. And I say that because I have a team right now that I was asked to kind of turn around about a year and a half ago. And, and it wasn't that they were on a, on a wrong track. They were just new, and they hadn't really worked together. You know, the management saw them as the least productive team. I saw that as a new team. You know, they're not going to be productive as a brand new team. Mm -hmm. And so I spent the time to build the trust within the team rather than survey the team and figure out what's going on. And How build, do you, sorry. Yes, How do you build trust? I built trust two ways. Authentic leadership, which means I did not try to act as though I was the one that was going to salvage this team. This was a group effort. We had tasks at hand that we all discussed openly. And we, we I let the team, even though if I knew they were going to pick a route that wasn't going to work, I let them choose it anyways. And I would say to them, well, I think we should try it this way because that's what Agile is teaching us. And what you're doing may or may not align well with that, but let's give it a shot. Let's see. You know, mm -hmm. I could be wrong. Let's try it. And I knew more or less that it would fail. And with a safe environment, I allowed that to happen. And that helped build trust. And they say, well, you're right. You know, the way you mentioned it probably was better. Let's try it. <laughs> and so we would try ultimately doing, not necessarily my way, but just the way that, that Agile has taught it to be done, or in our case, Scrum. Uh, and, and that helped build trust. I also created an environment where we could be friends. And, and we could do things outside of the project. And this wasn't just a, we have to do work for work's sake. You know, let's get to know who each other is. Let's have uh, lunches occasionally. We even go out to movies and have pizza nights uh, and, and build that relationship. Project management is largely relationship driven. We have to have strong relations with our team, with our clients, uh, and, and with our key stakeholders. And that's one way to build them, authentic leadership, uh, it's, it's a very powerful tool. Does that help answer? Mm -hmm. okay. So we have these these two methods, waterfall and agile. We have tools that accomplish the same types of principles. That means getting a project to a successful completion. I'm not going to go into great detail on tools, but I mentioned a little bit earlier. We have to manage issues. We have to manage your risks. We have to manage uh, expectations, unrealistic expectations sometimes. Uh, one of the key things I've seen project managers struggle with mm -hmm. is uh, when a organization or a client expects something sooner than it can be delivered. Never had that happen, right? Never been told, uh, have this done by tomorrow when it's going to take you a week to do it. Or have this done by tomorrow and it normally takes 10 people and you only have 4 people to do it. And there's very little sense in arguing it, i found. Make your case. Say, I need to have $10,000 to do this or I need 10 days to do this, or I need 10 uh, people to do this. If they say no, then say document, document's key, and then proceed, giving them updates very quickly and consistently throughout, showing them the trend. And if you're right, they will learn fairly quickly that what their estimate was incorrect, and yours was hopefully accurate. It's usually somewhere in between. <laughs> usually the project manager is trying to be a little protective and put a little buffer in there, and, and the leadership team kind of knows that, and so they undercut a little bit, and it's the back and forth. So you have to have good documentation. You have to have realistic expectations and understand where each person's coming from. During my doctorate, I took a lot of classes on organization development, and one of the things they taught there is that you have to understand the system as a whole. Your project is one piece of a large organization in many cases, or it could be one piece of your 
uh, start a company, you may have several projects. If you put all your focus into that one, what happens to the rest? You have gotta keep that in mind as a project manager. There's other projects out there. And so yours may not get the funding you hope and may not get the attention you hope and there might be a very good reason for that. So just bear that in mind from a system standpoint. So I've covered a lot tonight in terms of just an introduction in, into project management mm -hmm. and the, the space of communication, organization, and focus. A little bit about some of the tools and the two methodologies. Uh, there's plenty more to talk about in that space as well, but we can cover that in a deeper dive. I want to know what are some of the questions that you have, but not only just the questions, what are some of the takeaways you plan to use, hopefully? I plan to be a good listener because good listener. I love to talk, so <laughs> I plan to use that from tomorrow. That's good. That's good. Start small. Don't, don't dive into it. No, 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 small. It's going to take a lot of work. <laughs> <laughs> it is hard, and I struggle. I mean, we all do. It's, it's, it's difficult. What about others? Um, from your experience, like what kind what, have you ever been um, involved in like startup kind of environment where you have to manage projects and how do you, um, like what are the challenges? The challenges of managing projects, the big ones? Well, it's dealing with those that don't know how to communicate and don't know how to organize and be, no, th th that's a big part of it. <laughs> <laughs> it it's, uh, you know, to be honest, the biggest challenge is expectations, I think. When you look at all the project failures out there, and there are tons of them, the research shows I mean, staggering amounts, anywhere from 60% all the way to as few as 30%, big chunks of the way of projects fail. And failure is, is uh, across industry. So it's IT, construction, uh, aerospace, transportation. They all have these super high failure rates. And, and why is that? I mean, what's the common denominator across all those? People is one, expectations another. And you can dive into a lot of these, uh, uh, not proper funding, uh, biases, uh, not enough skill sets, uh, uh, not enough training, uh, I mean, a lot of it comes into it. But if you if you don't have the foundations that we've talked about tonight, in other words, that, that again, that communication, the uh, organization, the focus, <coughs> and the expectations, if you don't have those, the chances of success are very, very slim. Even if you've got the best tools in the world, even if you all understand Microsoft Project, even if you all have the PMBOK, Project Management Body of Knowledge book memorized, the chances of success are extremely small if you don't incorporate those other foundational pieces. And that's why it's staggering to me why I put this book in upside down, I have to fix it, I'm just that detail oriented. Um, <laughs> even if you uh, are really good at all the rest and, and have all that memorized, if you don't have those foundations set, you, you're, you're going to fail. I mean, it's just it's a matter of time. Um, you know, one of the things that I remember learning early on in project management is that if you if you put your your mind towards understanding those foundational aspects and you walk into a project, even if you don't have a lot of experience, you walk into a project and be uh, authentic, you know, with your team, with where you're at, where the team is at in skill set, where your organization is at in maturity. And you have those conversations, you're on the same page, you really set yourself up for a much better chance of success. And and, and it's the projects that don't do that that fail, that really run into those troubles. Uh, communication, if, if you're not communicating with your key stakeholders, and it's, uh, we love to be able to you know, sometimes say that this group just isn't being realistic, we're not going to communicate with them. They're, just, they're out in left field, we don't want to talk to them. And it's easy to say, well, leadership is being leadership again, and, and they just don't understand the project, and we're just going to go on our own. Well, if you don't come together, what are the chances of success? I mean, what are the chances that this project is going to succeed? Extremely small. I think that's why we see so many of those failure rates. I think I need to explore the, um, the tools, the waterfall, and the agile. Because, um, and, and I don't know if anyone else here experiences this, but you're all creative people. And um, I have two employees, and as I look to scale things up, part of what we do is we, we create. We're improving products, and we're, mm -hmm. we're shifting, we're responding to the marketplace a little bit. <clears throat> and um, I didn't realize, um, or I don't have really well-defined um, strategies 
across the board, some that deal with taking something from the concept to creation. And then for those that are already kind of in the works, they're already in the hopper and they're partially done, I think that, you know, the short sprints to complete this and this and this and this. So it gets really easy to lose focus when I'm working with creative people because one of the girls I work with is incredibly brilliant, but her brain pings all over the place. <laughs> and so to, to, to be able to look at these strategies and study this and these tools so that I can contain that is probably going to be really valuable for me for what I'm, what I'm doing. That's good. That's good. You know, I have a trouble once in a while too, jumping around on topics a little much. Well, I just think it's creative brains. I think you know, once mm -hmm. you get one thing, you go, "Oh, well, what if I do this? And what if I do that?" And yeah. Yeah. Then, then before you know it, you know. Which is great during the discovery process. Mm -hmm. but yeah. Projects go right. through that sometimes where you're, you're stuck mm -hmm. on something, you don't know how to solve it, right? Mm -hmm. or, or at the beginning of the project, you don't even know how to proceed. And you have to have that that creative aspect to mm -hmm. it. And that's great as a project manager to be able to join in with that. Sometimes. We don't have those skill sets, but it's still. Mm -hmm. You yes. still got to eventually bring it in. <laughs> so, I, I don't know if this is really relating to what you're saying. I, I'm not exactly sure where you're coming from, but something that I tend to do mm -hmm. when I'm working on a project is I will pause for a couple of hours and document how I know it works. Oh, mm -hmm. that's good. And then I have this readme file or protocol available for cross-checking with other people on my team. And it's it's because this because sometimes I'm working on one project and then I get a little sub project and another sub project and sometimes it's time to split them off and document each one of them separately. And then I can hand it off so other people can use the materials that I've created. Mm -hmm. So that that's going to be really valuable for me. I was just going to say that. Make sure that you're sharing them because it, it, that's a great data set for the project. Uh, and especially if you were, you know, again, transferred to a project or, or mm -hmm. took a job, that information is helpful, extremely valuable to whoever comes in to take your place too. Yeah. So, yeah. And I, yeah. And sometimes I, I have stacks of paper on my desk and other times it's like, I'm done with this. I need a clean desk. I'm going to get file folders and shoop. Um, so uh, I, I have sort of a an expansion and organization phase in, mm -hmm. in projects I work in. You know, it's make a mess and yeah. then clean it up and organize it. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, it's a creative process. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I well, want to intentionally use more of the calendar for blocking off projects. Sure. I've done a little of that, but mostly my calendar is meetings that are with external or you know other partners. Right. So I want to use it for purposes of blocking yeah. time. Yeah. That's good. That's I good. have a question. So yeah. How do you balance kind of like collaborating and getting as many people to work on the project, and also like in lowering the amount of dependencies, so that you know things can actually move when maybe mm -hmm. one person gets stuck. <clears throat> So let me make sure I understand. I'll use the practice or the listening. <laughs> make sure I understand. You're talking about when you have a project team that's maybe larger and you're trying to uh, or maybe coordinate. You have, maybe you have three people, but you have three people doing a lot of different things okay. and all depend on each other. So like, how do you kind of how do you do your balances on that? So dependencies are usually mapped uh, through the use of the project management tool itself, which would be Microsoft Project. If you're a waterfall, you tend to use Microsoft Project or Excel or you know one of those smart sheets. Uh, uh, you can also track dependencies in an agile world through uh, the stories you're writing. So agile uses stories to document the requirements. Can I do? Oh, yes, absolutely, Sorry. totally yeah. understand. Yeah. Nice, thank you. Um, and, and you would document in there what uh, other tasks, uh, what other work they're dependent upon. Some way or another, you have to get it out in a, in a, a written form. Otherwise, it's going to be lost if, you, if you're just relying on the individuals to hold the information. There's a couple things that uh, we as humans are really bad at. One is holding lots of information up here, and the other is estimating. And those are two bad things to have in your uh, uh, you know, difficult to do box for project management, right? Because we're doing a lot of tasks and we uh, need to, to keep a lot of information together. So that's why we rely on these tools to help us with that. Okay. Yeah. And estimating, that's a whole discussion in itself. <laughs> 
there's there's uh, a lot of research on how poor we as humans are at estimating. Just think about the last time you estimate how long it would take to get to work when we had snow. Uh, you know, it, it, we have all these things that come and impact uh, our, our, our plans, and, and uh, they just don't work out as like we hoped. Well, let me leave you with one final comment before we close. Each of you have interesting projects. They're all diverse, but they will rely on the same foundational aspects of communication, organization, and focus. If you use those three, you can separate yourselves from those that aren't, which is a big difference. Because I'll tell you, working with a lot of professionals, both in education, healthcare, transportation, and a whole bunch of other industries, that those three sets are not used as often as they should, and you will be uh, a much better place as a project manager, but also as uh, an employee or as a uh, CEO of your own startup, then your competition will be if you use those three. You're each uh, pushing the boundaries also in, in terms of where we're going next, and I appreciate the time to speak with all of you tonight, and this has been just a, a thrill, so wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.